Hello everyone and welcome to the second lecture related to the physical pharmacy one module. Uh, this lecture is supposed to be given today the 9th of March 2020. So in the previous lecture I talked about the physical pharmacy uh, module, the importance of this physical pharmacy module and I said that it's important for us to understand the physical properties of the raw materials and the intermediate uh, products or uh, steps that lead to the final formulation not only this but also understanding the physical properties of the final dosage form uh, and that's the aim of teaching the physical pharmacy module actually we need to understand all the physical bases related to the formulation process so um, that's that's the important thing I want to mention before going into the details of this lecture As I stated in the first lecture that I'm going to talk about uh, solutions of non-electrolytes in this chapter which is chapter 5 and the objective of the objectives of this chapter is related to the identification and descriptions of the four colligative properties of non-electrolytes uh, solutions uh, and understanding the various types of pharmaceutical solutions. I mentioned in the first lecture that uh, we are dealing with systems. Uh, these systems are termed as dispersions. So according to the uh, type of dispersion, which is depending on the um, dispersed phase and the dispersion media, uh, and according, according to this, uh, the classification of the dispersed phase and the dispersion medium uh, into three classes these including molecular dispersion coarse dispersions and uh, colloidal dispersions and I talked about what, what are the differences between these three uh, different uh, dispersions so now I'm going to continue uh, with this lecture and we are going to talk uh, a little bit about how to express the concentrations of uh, different uh, uh, different solutions uh, so uh, regardless of being solution of electrolyte or non electrolyte we sometimes need to express the concentration of a solution and these include molarity, molality, normality, mole fraction, and percentage expressions in addition to the equivalent weights. So these are uh, the most important things need to be considered because when we want to prepare any kind of solution we need to exactly know how much active ingredients are included in the formulation and uh, understanding how to calculate these expressions uh, are really important for us in order to develop uh, the formulations uh, that contain exactly the amount uh, we need uh, to be present in, in the formulation. So in terms of the concentration expression, we do have the molarity and uh, the molarity can be defined as the number of moles or the gram molecular weights of solutes of solute or solutes sometimes in one liter of solution. So that's the definition of molarity. So it's, it's the number of moles or the gram molecular weights of a solute 
or more than one solute in one liter of solution. On the other hand, normality is uh, defined as the gram equivalent weights of solute in one liter of solution. That's the second expression of concentration. So sometimes we can express the concentration of a solution in terms of molarity or normality. If we move to molality, it can be defined as the number of moles of solute in 100 grams of solvent. So here we have something uh, different. So in the first uh, two definitions for molarity and norm normality, uh, we have one liter of solution in one liter of solution. But now in molality, uh, the moles of solute in hundreds and uh, 1,000 grams of the solvents uh, in 1,000 grams of the solvent uh, now moving to mole fraction mole fraction is the ratio of the moles of one constituent of a solution to the total moles of all, all constituents so we have it's a fraction so we have different materials within the formulation for example and in case of solution we have the solute and the solvents so it's the ratio of the uh, moles of one constituent um, for example the moles of the solute or the moles of the solvents uh, of uh, inside the solution to the total moles of all constituents. Now, if we are talking about mole percent, it's the moles of one constituents in 100 moles of the solutions. That's the, uh, uh, the definition of mole percent. Uh, now, moving to another expressions, which these expressions are very important for us, which is the percent by weight uh, w slash w that's very important or the per percent by volume so it's v slash v uh, or the percent weight in volume which is w slash v so in case of the percent by weight it's the grams of solute in 100 grams of solution that's the first definition uh, and the percent by volume it's the milliliters of solute in 100 milliliters of solution and here I just want to uh, to uh, just make you notice that the expressions of uh, the grams and mil should be written in the correct way so the gram is just the letter G the milliliters is ML the L is capital so please whenever you want to write uh, these expressions try to make sure to write these expressions in the correct way right so if you want to say gram it should be written just like small um, G letter or if, if you want to express milliliter so you have to write it M small L capital so these are very important for us uh, and the third expression related to the percent uh, which is the uh, percent weight in volume so in this case we have the grams of solute in 100 milliliters of solution now here I just want to, uh, to to tell you something which is very important for for us if someone just asks you to prepare a solution or any other kind of formulation and just he mentioned the percent without mentioning uh, the type of the percentage whether it is weight per weight or volume per volume or weight per volume so what kind of percentage you are going to use so in case it doesn't mention the abbreviation for the type of the percentage you have to use the weight per, per, per volume percentage okay so that's that's uh, how to deal with such uh, case or such situation now the last one the last expression is a milligram percent 
so it's the number of milligrams of solute in 100 milliliters of solution so uh, it's uh, similar to the percent uh, weight per volume but in this case we do have a milligram instead of grams of solute so we have here milligrams of solute in 100 milliliter of solution that's the difference between the two these are very important for us because these are the tools by which we are preparing the different formulations uh, when you say I have 10% of paracetamol in such kind of solution you are expressing the exact amount of the active ingredient uh, inside the formulation or when you said when you say that uh, for example normal saline solution is containing 0.9 percent sodium chloride in, uh, in in water so it can define the chemistry of this kind of solution so it composed of exact amount of sodium chloride in a defined uh, volume of the solute uh, solvent sorry so uh, you should be careful regarding using these expressions and also you should be careful regarding using the abbreviations for uh, the solute or the solvent uh, such as the gram and the milliliter now an important question is how to calculate the different concentration expressions now this slide will show you how to uh, calculate the different concentration expressions so um, an aqueous solution of ferrous sulfate is prepared by adding 41.5 grams of ferrous sulfate to enough water to make 100 milliliters of solution at 18 degrees centigrade the density of the solution is 1.0375 and the molecular weight of ferrous sulfate is 151.9 gram uh, per mole so uh, calculate a the molarity b the molality uh, see the mole fraction of ferrous sulfate um, that's the first thing and the mole fraction of water the mole fraction the mole percent of the two constituents and d the percentage by weight of ferrous sulfate so that's that's a very uh, simple and very nice question that show you how to calculate the uh, different uh, concentration expressions related uh, uh, to uh, ferrous sulfate solution so in order to calculate the molarity of ferrous sulfate uh, in solution in aqueous solution so we need to calculate the moles of ferrous sulfate so the number of moles of ferrous sulfate is the number of grams of ferrous sulfate divided by the molecular weight of ferrous sulfate so in this case uh, 41.5 that's the weight of ferrous sulfate divided by 151.9 uh, we can get the number of moles of uh, ferrous sulfate now the molarity can be easily uh, calculated by dividing the number of moles of ferrous sulfate by the number of liters of solution so in this case we have the number of moles and we have one liter of the solution so we can easily calculate the uh, uh, molarity of the solution so in this case we can express the concentration of ferrous sulfate in the aqueous solution of ferrous sulfate using the molarity expression that's one thing now the second thing is how to calculate the molality of ferrous sulfate uh, aqueous solution and the question I don't have the um, the number of grams of the solvent so uh, only I have 
the density of the solution. So what I need to, st to do here is to convert uh, the volume of the solution into the weight of the solution uh, using the density. So the grams of the solution equals to the volume of the solution multiplied by the density. So I do have uh, the volume of the solution which is 100, uh, 1000 grams of the uh, 100 milliliter 1000 milliliters of the uh, solution and by multiplying this with the density we will get the weight of the solution now because I know exactly how many grams of uh, ferrous sulfate uh, are added to the water to get the solution so by subtracting the uh, number of grams of ferrous sulfate from the total weight of the uh, solvent we will get the weight of the uh, solvent so right uh, so in this case the weight of the solvent is 1037.5 minus 41.5 which is the weight of, of ferrous sulfate so in this case the weight of the solvent is 900 96 uh, uh, that's the weight of the solvent so by dividing the moles of ferrous sulfate by the weight of the solvent we will get the molality and in this case by dividing um, the, the number of moles which is 0 0.2732 uh, divided by 0 0.996 so the mo molality of the solution is 0 0.27 three um, so as you can see here that the expression of the molality is small m while that of molality is a capital M and also there is a difference uh, in the concentrations using the two expressions so it's not the same so um, when we say molarity that should be expressed exactly uh, uh, according to the uh, equation and also when we talk about molality we need to calculate it in the exact way the numbers are not the same uh, between the two expressions now the third thing is how to calculate the molar fraction of uh, both uh, the ferrous sulfate and also the water we do have two constituents uh, in this solution the ferrous sulfate and the water so the molar fraction uh, of ferrous sulfate can be uh, calculated by dividing the moles of ferrous sulfate by the total moles of the uh, constituents of the solution which is the moles of water plus the moles of ferrous sulfate so we already have the moles of ferrous sulfate and then we need to calculate the number of moles of water by calculating the number of moles of water we can calculate the overall number of moles of the constituents and then dividing the moles of ferrous sulfate by the total will get the molar fraction of ferrous sulfate or dividing the uh, number of moles of water by the total number of moles of the constituents we will get the uh, the molar fraction of water and uh, it's important to mention here it's important to mention here that um, the molar fraction is a fraction so the molar fraction of ferrous sulfate is 0 0.049 0 0.0049 while that of water is 0 0.9951 so adding the molar fractions of both water and uh, and ferrous sulfate uh, is always giving a one now if we want to calculate the mole percent of ferrous sulfate we just simply by multiplying the mole fraction by 100 so we'll get the mole fraction of uh, 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 sorry the mole percent of ferrous sulfate if we want to calculate the mole percent of water we also can do it 
by multiplying the uh, mole fraction of water by 100 so in this case we'll get 99.51 that's the mole percent of water while uh, the mole percent of aerosolate is 0.49 percent so that's the way of calculating the mole fraction of the different constituents uh, of the solution and also how to calculate the mole percent of uh, the ingredients including in the solution and the last thing uh, related to this example is how to calculate the percentage by weight of ferrosulfate uh, in the uh, in the previous slides I showed you how to calculate the uh, uh, the different expressions molarity molality um, mole fractions and so on in this slide just the calculation of percentage by weight um, now if we want to do that we need to divide the number of grams of ferrous sulfate by the number of grams of the solution uh, multiplied by 100 so I do have 41.5 which is the grams of ferrosulfate divided by uh, 1037.5 grams that's the weight of the solution uh, and then multiply this by 100 so the percentage weight by weight for this solution is 4 percent now um, I want to to ask you this question uh, how to convert uh, this percentage into uh, for example uh, weight per volume so uh, as you can see if you want to convert this percentage into a percentage uh, weight per volume you need to divide the weight of ferrosulfate by the uh, hundred, uh, 1000 milliliters of the solution so in this case 41.5 divided by 1000 milliliters multiplied by 100 so um, in this case we will get 4.15 percent weight per volume so as you can see here the expression of the concentration using the percentage is not the same if for the same solution if I'm using percentage weight per weight I'm getting 4 percent but if I'm using a percentage weight per volume the concentration will be uh, something uh, different so in this case I'll get 4.15 percentage so that's very important for you to understand and exactly use these percentages because any mistake will give completely different concentration and this is very important why it's important because if you are dealing with very uh, toxic material or sometimes if the drug is very potent even a slight change in the concentration will cause uh, fatal consequences so you need to prepare a formulation that's exactly as described uh, because any increase or decrease in concentration will either um, doesn't give the therapeutic efficacy of the medication or sometimes cause some toxic effects so we need to make sure that we are preparing the formulation exactly uh, using the same concentration expression now for more training uh, on how to calculate the different expressions uh, please have a look on examples 5.2 to 5.5 pages 217 to 219 uh, as a homework so please have a look and let me know if you have any uh, questions uh, related to these examples Now after talking about the uh, concentration expressions, the different expressions and showing 
how to calculate these different expressions uh, the next topic is related to the ideal and real solutions uh, so um, in the last lecture I mentioned that the collocative properties of non electrolyte solutions are regular uh, so um, for example if we have the same concentration uh, of two different solutions of non electrolytes they will show approximately the same uh, colligative properties while in case of solutions of electrolytes they show some anomaly or deviation from when we when we use the same concentration compared to the non electrolyte and the reason is related to the interaction between uh, the particles existing in the solution so uh, if there is some interactions between the particles in solution or some forces so in this case we will see some deviations uh, in the in the final properties uh, the colligative properties of uh, the solution so that's that's uh, the first thing I want to mention and going more into uh, in order to define the ideal and real solution we will uh, just go back to the chapter 2 as the definition of ideal gas uh, so uh, in chapter 2 um, the, def uh, the ideal gases can be defined as uh, the ones uh, in which there is no attraction between the molecules okay so that's the definition of the ideal gas. Um, um, and accordingly, the ideal solution can be defined as um, the system in which there is no change in the properties of the components. Uh, so other than dilution. So when you mix the different constituents together uh, uh, in the solution, no heat will be evolved or absorbed during the mixing process that's something ideal and the final volume of the solution will be an additive properties of the individual constituents so uh, that's the other definition that's the definition of the ideal solution uh, so when we prepare a solution and the solution in the ideal uh, state then we will see that when we mix the individual constituents of the solution so there is no change in the properties of the components other than the dilution uh, that's the only thing uh, so th there is no heat is evolved uh, no heat is absorbed during the mixing process and the final volume of the solution is the addition of the individual volumes of the uh, constituents. Uh, so uh, in another way no shrinkage or expansion uh, will happen when the substances are mixed and the constitutive properties for example the vapor pressure, refractive index, surface tension and the viscosity of the solution are the weighted averages of the properties of the pure individual constituents so that's something very ideal because when we are dealing with normal solution um, as you can see when you want to dissolve uh, any uh, chemical substance in any solvent there's sometimes an absorption of the heat or releasing of the heat expansion of the volume or shrinkage of the volume uh, so uh, it, it's it's uh, it's not an ideal situation and that's why we do have the ideal and the real solution the ideal state is something uh, different compared to the real solution from the previous uh, slide we can conclude that the ideality uh, of gases uh, it means 
a complete absence of attractive forces. While the ideality and solution, it means complete uniformity of attractive for forces. So we have different, uh, different meaning. In the Gaza state, we have complete absence of attractive forces. But in the uh, liquid state, because we have a more condensed matter, so what we are expecting to see is the presence of the attractive forces. Uh, but ideality in this case means the uniformity of attractive forces. So imagine if we have like a mixture of two uh, different constituents uh, in the solution, like A and B. So if we are saying that this solution is ideal, it means that the attractive forces between A and A, B and B, and A and B should be of the same order. Uh, I mean, it should be uh, the same uh, forces, uh, same attractive forces. So in this case, we can say that this uh, solution is ideal. Now, as an example of uh, ideal solutions or real solutions, uh, if we mix 100 milliliters of methanol with 100 milliliters of ethanol, uh, we will get a final volume of the solution which is 200 milliliters. No heat is evolved or absorbed and the solution is nearly ideal. So it doesn't uh, uh, it doesn't mention that that the solution is ideal. It's nearly ideal because the ideality is something absolute. It's a hundred percent. So uh, even with this example we are nearly ideal but not ideal but if we are using like 100 milliliters of sulfuric acid with 100 milliliters of water however the volume of the solution will be 180 milliliters so there is a shrinkage of uh, of of the volume of the two constituents forming this kind of solution this is at room temperature and the mixing is uh, accompanied by uh, evolution of heat so it's an uh, exothermic reaction happening here and the solution is said to be non-ideal uh, and uh, the non-ideality is actually referring to reality so uh, non-ideal is real as with gases some solutions are quite ideal in a moderate concentration uh, wh whereas other approach ideality only under extremes extreme dilution so uh, uh, again we do have uh, variability in the solution now uh, this is how we uh, examine the different types of solutions so we have a variety of ingredients that could be used in the formulation process and when we mix the things together, the substances together, the materials together, we will get some uh, variation in the properties of the final solution and these are related to the physics, uh, the physical properties of the different constituents and that's why the physical pharmacy module is important for us. So after talking about the uh, types of uh, solutions, uh, whether we have a real or I ideal solutions, now we are going to move to another expression, uh, which is an important expression, and that's uh, what we call it the escaping tendency. Now imagine if we have two bodies, and these two bodies have the same temperature. Uh, in, in other words, they are in an equilibrium status. So in this case, what we are saying is that um, the escaping tendency of heat uh, from one object to another object is actually is the same or identical to the escaping tendency of the heat from the second object to the first object and that's why we are in a thermal equilibrium status 
while if the temperature of the two objects or the two bodies are not the same so what we have is one object has higher temperature and the other one has uh, uh, an object with a lower temperature so what we have here is the flow of the temperature from the hotter body uh, to the uh, uh, colder body so uh, in this case uh, the the scaling ten tendency of uh, of of the heat from object A is higher than the escaping uh, towards the object B is higher than that the uh, higher than the escaping tendency from object B towards A and that's why um, the, the process of transfer is happening uh, so it's going from the object of higher temperature to the object of uh, lower temperature until the temperature um, become identical until the temperature becomes an, uh, uh, identical between the two objects and then the system is finally reaching the equilibrium the thermal equilibrium status so the escaping tendency what does it mean uh, what does it mean in principle is actually it described the flow of heat uh, of uh, from one object to another object um, uh, and the heat is flowing because um, uh, the uh, the object has higher energy compared to the other one uh, so that's why it's flowing actually from the hotter to the colder body uh, until they reach the equilibrium status uh, so for this example the temperature is the quantitative measure of the escaping tendency of heat and uh, as I said uh, at thermal equilibrium the two bodies uh, will have the same temperature and also they have the same uh, uh, escaping tendency in this case now uh, as as you know probably uh, that during the formation of any solution what we are putting we are putting solute in a solution and uh, uh, the system will uh, undergo uh, some physical or chemical transformation and a quantitative measure of the escaping tendencies of material substances undergoing physical or chemical transformation uh, this expression they call it the uh, free energy so uh, as with the example of the temperature what we have is the temperature is this is a quantitative measure of the escaping tendency of heat now the chemical and the physical transformations uh, happening uh, in the materials uh, now these transformations the quantitative measure of these transformations uh, we call it the free energy now imagine if we have a reaction like between a and b so um, there is some energies happening uh, a, a transfer in the energies so like for example if you are dissolving a solute uh, in a solvent so the process of uh, of the dissolution process we have break down the uh, bonds between the solute break down into the forces between the solvents and then making the uh, a new bonds or interactions between the solute and the solvent and that's why the uh, solution process is happening so unless there is a free energy uh, higher for the uh, breakdown uh, of the uh, bonds between the solute molecules and the solvent molecules to form the new interaction between the solute and the solvent the dissolution process is not going to happen so um, that's what we mean by uh, the uh, free energy so this physical and chemical transformation uh, a quantitative measure for these transformations is the free energy so for pure substances the free energy per mole they call it the molar free energy while in case of the solution what we have is the partial molar free energy or, or what we call it the chemical potential so that's these are the 
uh, expressions for the escaping tendency for pure uh, substances and for uh, substances in solution state. Uh, now, if we want to mention an example, uh, for example, if, you, if we have uh, ice, one mole of ice, uh, and uh, one mole of liquid, so imagine if we are uh, one mole of ice at temperature above uh, zero degree centigrade uh, and uh, one uh, at one atmosphere, atmospheric pressure, so uh, in, in this case w the delta G uh, will be something negative, it means that the uh, uh, escaping tendency for the one mole of ice is higher than the escaping tendency of one mole of liquid uh, and that's why the delta G uh, or the free energy of one mole of ice is higher than the one mole of uh, uh, one mole uh, the free energy of one mole of liquid and the delta G in this case will be negative and if it is negative it will cause a spontaneous transfer of the ice into liquid and that's happening when we are at temperature above the zero while at zero what will happening is that we have uh, the same uh, free energy uh, between uh, between uh, for for one mole of ice and the same which is equal or identical to uh, the free energy of one mole of uh, liquid water so in this case we are in a thermal equilibrium status so um, there is no change in the physical state of the of the material but if we are working above zero degree centigrade uh, the escaping tendency of the uh, ice will be higher than the liquid and the delta g will be negative and thus cause the spontaneous uh, uh, transfer of ice into uh, into uh, water so from this we can conclude that the escaping tendency is an expression is very important expression for us um, uh, because what we are dealing we are dealing with the systems that have uh, constituents and sometimes when we are making the solutions uh, some physical or chemical transformations are happening and the description of the process the, uh, the, the principle that govern the process uh, the process the different processes uh, that happen during the formation process um, can be uh, described uh, by the escaping tendency like for example the transfer of heat from the hotter to the uh, colder body or when we want to describe the equilibrium t uh, uh, thermal equilibrium process or sometimes the conversion of the physical state from one state to another all these can be uh, can be described using the escaping tendency and the quantitative measure um, in this case we will have the uh, molar free energy if we are dealing with the pure substances or the partial free energy if we are dealing with uh, or the chemical potential if we are dealing with uh, a solution uh, and the example for this uh, is, is already mentioned uh, is uh, the conversion of ice uh, into water and vice versa if we are dealing with uh, uh, different temperatures above the zero or at zero. Now, as we mentioned previously, that the uh, temperature is a quantitative uh, expression of the escaping tendency of heat, and also the free energy is the another quantitative expression uh, of. Uh, the physical and chemical transformations uh, in the systems. Now, um, the vapor pressure of solution is also another uh, important property uh, because it can be considered as a quantitative expression of escaping tendency as well. So, Raoult recognized that 
in an ideal solution, the partial vapor pressure of each volatile constituent, uh, the partial vapor pressure of each volatile constituent is equal to the vapor pressure of the pure constituent multiplied by a small fraction in the solution. Like for example, if we have two constituents A and B, so uh, the partial vapor pressure of A, for example, is equal is equal to the uh, partial uh, is, is equal to the vapor pressure of of the pure uh, A multiplied by the mole fraction uh, of A in the solution, and the same for B. So if you want to calculate the uh, partial vapor pressure of uh, of the constituent B in the solution, so it equals to the vapor pressure of the pure B material multiplied by the uh, partial of, uh, 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 by the mole fraction of B in the solution. Now, example 5.6 uh, show uh, how to calculate the partial vapor pressure of uh, the different constituents in the solution. Like for example, uh, in this example, uh, the question is, what is the partial vapor pressure of benzene and of ethylene chloride in a solution at a mole fraction of benzene of 0 0.6? Um, in this case, the vapor pressure of pure benzene at 50 degrees centigrade is 200 68 millimeters and that uh, of uh, ethylene chloride is 236 so in order to calculate the partial vapor pressure uh, vapor pressure of uh, substance B uh, which is the benzene in, in this case so what we need to do is to multiply the vapor pressure of pure benzene by the mole fraction, so we have 268, uh, thus the uh, vapor pressure of benzene and the mole fraction of benzene is 0 0.6. Now in order to calculate the uh, partial vapor pressure of um, ethylene chloride in the solution, so what we need to do is to multiply the uh, vapor pressure of ethylene chloride uh, which is in this case uh, 236 millimeters multiplied by the molar fraction so the molar fraction is 1 minus 0 0.6 and equals 0 0.4 so the uh, partial vapor pressure of uh, of uh, of ethylene chloride in this case is uh, 94.4 millimeters now the overall uh, pressure, vapor pressure for the solution will be the additive, uh, uh, the additive, uh, uh, the uh, the addition of uh, the partial vapor pressure of uh, constituent A and that of constituent B, and in this case we do have the sum of the partial vapor pressure of uh, ethylene uh, ethylene chloride and that of benzene and the final uh, vapor pressure of the solution will be um, uh, 255.2 millimeter so what we can conclude from this uh, we can know exactly how the vapor pressure is changing when we are uh, dealing with the solutions of electrolytes and also if we have uh, a solution of electrolytes so monitoring these uh, these properties will give an indication about the identity of the solution and how the materials are behaving uh, inside the solution as very important for us uh, to monitor uh, either during the formulation process or after the formulation process in this slide um, uh, this figure shows the vapor pressure composition curve for an ideal binary system composed of ethylene chloride and benzene. Uh, so uh, now we have the ethylene chloride to the right hand and we have the benzene to the left hand. 
and then um, the x-axis represent the composition of the system so the molar fraction um, is changing by changing the composition of the system so for example um, uh, when we have a molar fraction uh, like of ethylene chloride 0 0.9 it means that I have 90% ethylene chloride and 10% uh, of benzene and according to the composition the vapor pressure the total vapor pressure of the system is changing like for 100% ethylene chloride I do have a, 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 a vapor pressure of uh, 236 but now if I use a mixture of ethylene chloride with benzene in uh, a percentage of 90% ethylene chloride then the total vapor pressure is actually uh, composed of a contribution of 90% of ethylene chloride and 10% benzene and as we change the composition of the mixture we will get a different value for the total vapor pressure depending on uh, how much uh, ethylene chloride is present in the mixture and how much uh, benzene is existing uh, so from this we can actually uh, know for example the composition of the mixture depending on what on the total vapor pressure because we know exactly uh, that this is an ideal uh, binary system and also um, the uh, total vapor pressure is is uh, for the mixture is a contribution uh, for the two materials uh, existing in the in the system so it's important for us to monitor these properties in order to get an information uh, like for example about the composition or from the composition to get an uh, idea about the total vapor pressure of the of the mixture So as an application of the uh, uh, Raoult's law is the calculation of the aerosol vapor pressure. Aerosols are uh, types of uh, pharmaceutical preparations. They contain a liquid uh, uh, formulation or liquid solution inside the container and there is some uh, gases included above the liquid uh, to provide the vapor pressure that pushes the, uh, the, the liquid or the solution uh, through the valve uh, in the form of uh, sprayed droplets uh, that will uh, deposit it on the site of application. So um, it's important to measure or to estimate the vapor pressure above the liquid in order to provide the driving force that uh, push the liquid material uh, from the container and provide this spraying process so what we are using is to put these gases and we call these gases as as propellants so we sometimes use one propellant other times we use a mixture of propellants uh, to provide uh, the uh, vapor pressure so in this example, the vapor pressure of pure CFC11, that is one type of propellant, it has a molecular weight uh, as 137.4 at 21 degree centigrade. The, uh, the vapor pressure is 13.4 uh, PCI. And that of CFC12, so that's another type of propellant, the molecular weight is 120.9 and the vapor pressure is 80. 4.9 so as you can see here that the vapor pressure of propellant uh, CFC 12 is much higher compared to the first one now a 50 to 50 mixture by gram weight that is very important is giving 50 50 gram weight but what we have is actually the molecular weight is different so what does it mean that we have different moles 
between the two uh, propellants. Uh, so uh, they use 50 to 50 mixture of uh, the two propellants on a gram weight. So in this case, in order to calculate the number of moles, so what we need to do is uh, to consider that we have 100 grams uh, because it will be a fraction anyway a hundred grams of the total mixture of the gases uh, half of it which is 50 grams is for the first prop propellant and the other 50 for the second propellant so the uh, number of moles um, is for the first one is 0 0.364 mole and that uh, for the other one is 0 0.414 moles uh, for the second propellant so uh, in order to calculate we need to calculate in order to calculate the partial vapor pressure for the two uh, uh, propellants we need to calculate the molar fraction and the molar fraction of the first propellant is equals to the number of moles of uh, propellant one divided by the number of moles of the two constituents uh, so that's one and then if we multiply the molar fraction by the uh, vapor pressure of the pure propellant we will get the uh, partial vapor pressure of this propellant in, in the mixture and for the second one we will follow the same procedure so we will calculate the uh, molar fraction of the second propellant and multiply it by the vapor pressure of the second uh, propellant and then we'll get the partial vapor pressure for the second one uh, so in order to calculate the total vapor pressure of the mixture we will add the partial vapor pressures uh, of the two propellants uh, so in this case we will uh, have the sum of them and it will be equal to uh, 51.5 PCI so in this case we'll have some estimation of the vapor pressure of the uh, propellant mixture inside the formulation we don't know uh, if this is enough or this is not enough this is a typical vapor pressure for this kind of formulation or not but that's one way of estimation uh, the uh, uh, vapor pressure of the system composed of two propellants uh, uh, in this case so at the end of this lecture um, I discussed um, the concentration expressions the different expressions that could be used in the formulation of uh, pharmaceutical uh, solutions of non electrolytes and showed you the difference between the different types and also we moved into the uh, definition of ideal and real solutions and then uh, we moved to the scaling tendency uh, and sh showed you some uh, expressions that could be used um, uh, related to the uh, solutions uh, of non-electrolytes and then the relationships between uh, ideal solutions and Raoult's law uh, and how we can apply Raoult's law in the pharmaceutical field I hope that you uh, get the benefit of this lecture and uh, if you have any question please don't hesitate to contact me uh, and uh, thank you very much for listening